So yes, it is very important to network. But I think some people are so excited to get that interaction and say, like, I want to call with you. They don't tell people what they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Right. And and it, it's kind of it makes it very hard for me if somebody reaches out to me to say, OK, you want 15 minutes of my time. But what does that mean? Good afternoon, or I guess good morning, if you are tuning in anywhere west of the East Coast. Uh, I'm Jeff Kozlowski. I'm a marketing communications manager here at the School of Medicine and Dentistry at University of Rochester. So excited to bring another live career discussion to you. Um, so excited about our guest today. Uh, she is chief of staff at Viridian Therapeutics. They're a uh, startup biotech company in Boston, and she uh, graduated from uh, the uh, microbiology and immunology PhD program here at SMD in 2015. Yin Yin Wang, thank you so much for being part of our discussion today. How are you? I'm good. Hi, Jeff. Thank you so much for having me. This is really exciting. <laughs> yes, we really, really appreciate your time. Um, I know you've you know, uh, been part of some of the, uh, or one of the my hub, um, kind of career story events not too long ago. So it was, it was great to have you in town, but great to have you back in a virtual capacity as well. And first off can, you know, I, I did a very short introduction here at the top, but if you could tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah. Um, of course. So like you said, graduated 2015 from the, uh, I guess, it was immunology, microbiology, and virology. And then at some point we became, or my degree is microbiology and immunology. Um, I uh, knew that I wasn't going to be an academic, you know, uh, stay in academia. So took a little time, um, did a little bit in sales in biotech, life science consulting, um, digital health, and we can kind of dive into that later on. But currently, I am at Viridian Therapeutics. I am chief of staff, so I work very closely with our CEO um, and our executive team. Um, and Viridian Therapeutics is, we are a clinical stage company. Uh, we've got assets in um, phase one through three right now. Um, and our current asset is looking to treat patients with thyroid eye disease. Um, it is a, for the sciencey world, it is a um, anti-IGF-1R uh, monoclonal antibody. Um, and we're really excited to be able to bring this onto the market at some point to help patients. So. All right. And first, let's talk about sort of what influenced you uh, to get into science. You have kind of a, a fun story that involves your dad, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so my dad uh, is, he's an MD, PhD. Um, he was trained as a head and neck surgeon in China and then decided to come to the States. And so he actually did his PhD at the University of Rochester. Um, and I was, I grew up, you know, kind of between whatever, three and maybe 12 years of age. Um, in Rochester, stayed in like Whipple Park. There are pictures of me, you know, playing in the playground there. Um, and so that that love of science kind of, you know, you couldn't avoid it because it was just part of my daily life. Um, on the weekends, I would go to my dad's lab um, and he would pay me 25 cents a box to fill my pet tips. Um, I asked for 30 cents a box and he fired me. Because he said, you know, you don't you don't get a five cent raise after <laughs> after one day's worth of work. Um, but it was fun. It was, you know, I got to be exposed and talk to professors, his professor. Right. Um, and live in a kind of grow up in that lab space where pipettes and things like that were really just kind of are for the course. Um, he had wanted me to go into medicine. I did not. Um, and I thought a fair compromise would be to get a PhD. Um, and I also figured that if I got it from the same school as he did, there may be some nostalgic overlap and maybe soothe the sting a little bit of not going to medical school, um, a bit more. 
So it's it's been a really interesting journey to see Rochester as a child from the lens of, you know, kind of this is more of a playground and then come back as a grad student um, and, and experience that for myself. Yeah. So, you know, I, I know your dad played a big part, but how did you ultimately decide that Rochester was the place you wanted to be? Uh, you know, I think there were a lot of factors, right? Certainly, I had a great experience growing up. I knew that they had a wonderful program. Um, I interviewed at several places, and they had just gotten, you know, the new, what is it, MRB building. Um, and, and so there was just a lot of great new infrastructure and dedication to supporting grad students. Um, so at the end of the day, that really clinched it for me. But of course, I had family friends in the area. I knew I had a support system. Um, and, and so I also wanted, I went to University of Washington as an undergrad, and that gave me a really, you know, exciting experience of going into a big school, a big city. Admittedly, there were a lot of distractions. Um, and so for grad school, I wanted a place that was a little bit quieter, um, so I could focus on what I was there to do, which was get a PhD. Um, so it all just kind of worked out for the best. And like I said, I had, you know, I had my personal reasons for going there, but also just they had the best program. So it was an easy choice. Yeah. And you also mentioned at the top, you know, you, you didn't really have uh, the intention to pursue academia after graduation. Um, you knew, kind of knew that from the beginning, would love to hear just kind of, you know, so as you're entering grad school and, and deciding on your PI, would love to know just kind of some of the discussions or, or what those discussions looked like as far as, um, you know, let being upfront about like, Hey, the, you know, this is, I'm not interested in that academia path this is what I want to do and then maybe you know hit on just kind of the importance of making sure you have those conversations absolutely so you know to take a step back before I applied to grad school I had been a lab manager for two years um so I had you know in addition to obviously growing up in the lab space I had a lot of hands-on experience of what it was like to live and breathe the lab lifestyle um, academia lifestyle, right? I worked very closely with my PI, um, you know, to help write manuscripts, grants, all of that. And I just realized that that wasn't, that lifestyle, I just wasn't, I wasn't good at it for the lack of a better word, right? I knew I could do it for a short term, but as a career, it wasn't going to make me feel as fulfilled as perhaps something else. Um, at the same time, you have to keep in mind the temporal component of it, which was this it was around the time of the recession. It was really hard to get a job. Um, and it's really hard to get a job in industry with uh, only a bachelor's of science. So I had to get, I felt that I had to get uh, an advanced degree just so um, I could be competitive in the workspace. And of course, you know, a PhD, you're effectively, you've got a job or, or, you know, some sort of guaranteed employment for whatever the duration of your program was. Um, so, so that was really my motivation to get, to get my PhD. When I joined um, the program, you know, you do the series of rotations and I was really mindful having had my lab manager experience to know that the relationship with the PI and myself is really more important than the project that I was working on. Projects change, you, you know, something works, something doesn't work. You can't count on that, but the relationship between you and your PI is what's gonna stay consistent. And so without obviously joining the lab or doing a rotation and just upfront saying, I don't like academia, which I think is, you know, too aggressive, I really looked at what the individual PI's personality and, you know, focus is in terms of mentorship. Um, and for me, I was fortunate that all of the rotations that I had were PI's that were supportive of me as a person, um, as an individual, and not just of 
we need to get this project moving further along. Um, I ended up picking my PI, Chen Dong Li, because he kind of hit all of the um, priorities that I was looking for, right? I thought that he and I got along really well. He had a great lab with a lot of support from postdocs, um, and he had a lot of funding. And also, of course, I was interested in the projects that he was working on. But again, if it, the other three things weren't in place, um, the project was, wasn't going to be enough for me to want to stay in the lab. About a month after I you know, fully committed and joined the lab, he and I had a conversation of just, you know, what are you looking for in this, in this experience, right? Um, and, you know, I, I, I was just upfront with him and said, I don't think that academia is where I want to stay. Um, he kind of had a smile on his face because by then I think he saw that my experiments were not what you would call stellar. The, the air of ours <laughs> probably on the other side of being too comfortable um, for publication. <laughs> Uh, and so I think in a way he was almost relieved that I had the self-awareness of the fact that I'm more extroverted. I probably want to be, you know, have a different role um, more in terms of working with other individuals, uh, maybe more presentation based, more communication based, et cetera. And so he was like, that's great. You know, I obviously he's a PI, so that's what he knows. But he just said, let me know how I can help you. Um, and, and we went forward from there. The good news is that because I made it clear, I wasn't looking to get an academic position afterwards. The criteria that you need to build a resume for, uh, an academic career, you know, papers, going to a lot of conferences, um, reviewing papers, all of those things, you know, he didn't push me on because he knew that wasn't going to actually help me in my career path. So having that conversation up front just kind of took away a lot of the, the critical activities that other students may have needed for their career path, but wasn't going to serve me for mine. Yeah, that's it's important to, to get ahead of those things, um, not only to make your experience more worthwhile, but make others, you know, it does have an effect on, on others, too, that, that you hit on there at the end. Um, let's next touch on then. So, so you, you graduate and now you are kind of starting the next part of your professional journey. And I know you, you know, you've had uh, a few, a few positions since being a, a grad student. So I would love to talk a little bit about that, you know, your career journey up to this point. And, you know, you mentioned in some of our pre conversations that you, you know, you've, for a long time, consulting was where you wanted to be. That's what you wanted to do. And then that sort of focus uh, shifted a little bit. So so I would love to, to hear um, about that, that shift as well. Yeah. So as a grad student, you're, you know, and, and you kind of have to think that, again, um, when I was looking at other opportunities outside of academia, a lot of the resources that we have today just aren't as readily available, right? There was no LinkedIn live stream, things like that. So you really had to pull together random pieces of information of jobs that were out there that, you know, perhaps is still a bit of a black box. Um, and I think when you're in academia, consulting seems like this shiny, um, glamorous lifestyle uh, that people don't know what it is, but it sounds really, really good. And I was one of those people. Um, and I, in fact, I even talked to a lot of life science consultants and it sounded great. You go in, you know, you're a subject matter expert, you go in and you solve problems for companies um, and you get to do it repeatedly at a lot of companies, so you get a lot of exposure, you make a lot of money, you fly around the country, around the world, you know, you stay at nice hotels, you fly first class, it all sounds really wonderful. Um, and I'm not saying that it wasn't, but at the same time, you quickly learn that like, you know, a lot of as a consultant, the nuts and bolts of it is not that you go in and you just talk at the client. Um, 
it's a lot of PowerPoint making slides. It's a lot, you're still reading a lot of papers. You're still doing a lot of, you know, hands-on work. Um, and for me, I actually realized that I liked being a part of a cohesive group. Whereas as a consultant, you come in, you kind of parachute in, you solve the problems and it can be for a three month engagement. It can be for a year, but once you're done, you step back and you move to a new project and you don't really get to own what you did. Mm -hmm. Um, and to me, that part was a bit of a disconnect where I said, well, you know, I really would like to have a home, uh, instead of just kind of hopping around. It was great to be is, you know, it was basically like getting paid to do an MBA, right? You learn a lot about the processes of pharma companies, of biotech companies, but I'm a very social person and I connected really well with my clients. And I felt kind of sad that every few months or whatnot, I'd have to like start that relationship again. Um, it's, it's not unheard of. It's actually quite common for people to join a consulting firm or join the consulting career, do it for two and a half years and move on to something else. And that's just really what I did. Um, I took everything that I learned and put it into uh, another startup. Um, but I don't, I don't regret doing it. I think it was super educational. I think the only thing was people don't necessarily know what they're getting into as a consultant. Um, and it's a lot more aligning boxes and making sure the fonts are all consistent and, you know, creating a beautiful presentation than it is just people saying, welcome, you are the PhD. Tell us what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so now you are, you know, here, here you are, Viridian Therapeutics, uh, chief of staff. Is that a role, you know, that you, like when you first started grad school, is that something that you were like, oh, maybe I'm, I could, you know, chief of staff is, is a potential position for me, or is it just kind of like, you got you got into the job search, you know, a few years into your career, and you're like, oh, this sounds interesting. Um, so, you know, I always like to hear. It seems like you know when you're a, a lot of grad graduate trainees, um, you know, it's so uh, there's just a lot of opportunities out there that probably a lot of us don't even consider or know that are out there. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just curious. As chief of staff, was that sort of anywhere on your list of potential career paths? So it's really, really funny. Um, you kind of have to take a step back and understand that in a biotech, a tech space, the role of chief of staff is actually very new. Probably in the last 10 years or so, it's really kind of become this common thing. Um, chief of staff is historically a government or a military associated position, right? Like you, the White House has a chief of staff right. or senators or... Um, and then in the military, you're, you know, the army, you're the chief of staff in the army, and it's a very elevated position. Um, and those are, you know, especially like at the White House, it's, you're basically the right hand to the president, you're making a lot of the decisions, people report to you, you know, it's a very different model than in kind of the business sense. Um, and, and when you take that role, which is really kind of a facilitator is the best way to think about it. Um, they kind of make sure that things are running on time, that maybe they're not the ones making the decision, but the people who need to know that to make the decision know that, right? And, and they're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, in the business sense, there is a very wide range of what a chief of staff does or can do. It can be everything from a really qualified superhero admin to somebody more in my role with more of a science background or you know whatever the industry requires and helps work with the CEO or whoever they're working, you know, supporting to make strategic decisions, act as an advisor, you know, be the eyes and ears, and also, you know, kind of the right hand to them. So there's a there's a huge range. When I was you know, graduating, I didn't know that this role existed outside of a military, you know, like yeah. I watched the West Wing and, and you know, I, I saw who, who the chief of staff was on the West Wing, right? Um, I didn't think that that was what I wanted. However, if you look at the job description of what a chief of staff does, at least for me, 
those were all the things that I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to see how decisions were made. I wanted to work closely with decision makers, help them along. I'm kind of a busybody, so I'm really good at project management um, and making sure tasks are completed on time. I'm a social butterfly, so I like to work and make sure that different parts of the organization are talking to each other, right? Um, I don't mind putting together a PowerPoint slide. Uh, I, I appreciate the value of communication. So all of those things feed directly into the role of chief of staff for me. I just didn't know it existed. So it was just kind of kismet that I was able to match what I wanted to do with a role that happened to be available. Yeah. And how did you, st uh, just th thought of another question. Um, how did you find that? role i'm just curious was it kind of through networking or just online search because it, it's interesting you know that i can picture going you know finding you know like seeing a job posting on linkedin and being like you know going through the bullet points being like oh what those are those are all the things i want to do or is it kind of like a, a networking situation where it was like well we're looking for this person to do xyz by the time i was job searching for this specific role the role of chief of staff had become quite common. Okay. Right? Even at my old company, there was a chief of staff. Um, and so I had, by this time, I knew that this was a role that was something that I wanted. Funnily enough, when I applied to Viridian, I applied for a different position. Um, the chief of staff role wasn't, hadn't been posted yet. Okay. And I submitted my application and quite honestly, I was not the right fit for it, but you know, it, it's kind of a numbers game. So I, I, I put the application out there. A few weeks later, I saw that they posted for chief of staff and mm. I kind of kicked myself. I was like, oh, <laughs> if only I had waited, right? And then I thought, you know what? I should apply anyways. At the same time, our in-house recruiter had emailed me and said, hey, you know, thank you for applying to this other job. Do you have time to chat? And, you know, I started strategizing. I was like, all right, how do I gently tell him without sounding completely flaky that I don't really care about the other role anymore, <laughs> that I wanted this chief of staff role. Um, and I like mapped out this entire like process to prepare. Got on the call with me and he goes, hey, Yin Yin, so I know you applied for this role, but we just posted a chief of staff role that we think you would be more suitable for. And I was like, Kevin, let's go. Yes, um, I'm in. This, this is it. Um, so it was kind of, we were off to the races from there. Cool. Next, next thing I had. So, you know, we've, we've kind of hit on a few, but any other, you know, people hear a lot about like networking is key. Uh, you have, you should, you know, update your LinkedIn profile and all of those things are important in the job search. There's no question about it. Are there any atypical lessons that you've learned um, along your career journey so far? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think sometimes we get into our own heads and we don't think about, we think about the message that we're trying to get out and we don't think about how somebody else is receiving it. Mm. Um, so yes, it is very important to network. Um, but I think some people are so like excited to get that interaction and say like, I want to call with you. Um, they don't tell people what they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and it, it's kind of, it makes it very hard for me if somebody reaches out to me to say, okay, you want 15 minutes of my time, but what does that mean? So I would just be very clear, you know, communication is very important. Don't assume that somebody can predict what you're looking for. I don't know if somebody's looking for a job, career advice, et cetera. I think it goes a long way to put some guardrails around that. Yeah. You're not, you know, you can always say it nicely to say like, can I get 15 minutes of your time? I want to learn more about the role of chief of staff, right? Or, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, and that gives me a frame of reference. Um, other things to think about is who you're contacting. I wouldn't recommend contacting people that are super senior in the organization. They're quite busy. Um, and it's not that they don't want to talk to you, but they honestly may not have the time. 
but also they've been in the organization or they've been outside of, you know, grad school or what not long enough that perhaps their perspective is not as current. There are new tools, there are new mechanisms for recruitment that they may not be aware of. And so their experience may not be as applicable to you. I would really target people, you know, within like, I have to, I have to give the number to, to make myself relevant 10 years, but probably five is probably <laughs> more appropriate um, to really get a real time idea of, of what to, what to do. Um, and, and so, yeah, just sometimes, you know, one final thing is just, I've learned that common sense is not so common. So people, people will say something and, you know, or, or send an email that perhaps just doesn't, it, it doesn't flow. Like, I don't know what they want or what their next step is. Take the time to think about, you know, like, if I ask this, this is going to happen, what happens next? And make sure that that all tracks. Uh, you have opportunities to make a first impression and you kind of want to seize that. Yeah, our our last career discussion, a um, uh, gentleman who, who graduated, oh, I can't remember the year now, um, but a gentleman by the name of Lubin, he also went on to, to Boston and um, works in, bio, in the biotech industry. But he had, you know, he was, his, his focus was on LinkedIn, but goes back to one of the points you made there of like, if you're reaching out to somebody on LinkedIn, don't go to the CEO or the you know, senior VP, maybe go to somebody who's early in their career that maybe has a little more time or, you know, has more time to network. And, and then, you know, that could go a long way in that if you do get an interview there or when you're applying to the job in your cover letter or somewhere along the application process, you can say, I spoke to so-and-so at this company and there's a new you know there's a new reference for you so maybe we can speak specifically to biotech but if there's a postdoc somebody coming out of a postdoc um you know maybe what what career um options are out there and that you know i know that may be specific to their um i guess kind of individual interests yeah. but the good news is that coming out of a postdoc you almost can do anything that you want. And and that's almost a no answer, right? Um, and I say that because specifically for consulting, um, a lot of the big firms have recruitment cycles. And if as part of the recruitment cycle, it's actually kind of easier, right? Because there's a class of people you can kind of apply. If you're applying off cycle, it's notoriously more difficult because it depends on if somebody has left and then you apply um, and you're kind of joining this pool of everybody else. And I'm thinking about like BCG, McKinsey, Bay, these companies all have recruiting cycles. Mm -hmm. They take both people who just graduated um, from their PhDs, but also postdocs. So they kind of consider that one group, not in terms of experience or intelligence or anything like that, but just as a recruiting cycle, right? So you can absolutely join that. Um, you know, if you want to get into in industry on the science side, you can apply as a scientist or do a, a scientific postdoc. Um, it really depends on what you're looking to do and what your experience is, right? So if you are a postdoc and you've done a lot of wet lab bench work um, and suddenly you're applying to a role that is marketing, let's say, you need to demonstrate why you can make that look that leap. Um, and it needs to be more than, well, I want to do marketing, right? Maybe you have done some ad hoc or consulting or whatnot on the side, you've taken an MBA course, etc. You need to be able to draw that connection to whatever job it is. Um, but at the same time, if you're going outside of academia, people really value PhDs. So you've got that going for you. It's all about the story that you're trying to tell. Um, resource wise, you know, LinkedIn is always good. Industry, you know, you can apply to jobs in industry. As somebody who just did it, it is notoriously challenging because you, you know, I, I obviously landed in a great place, but there are, I probably, you know, pushed out 50 resumes where I didn't hear back as well. 
So I don't want to give this, you know, the story of this mythological, like, oh, I applied to this one company on the wrong job and I got the other job. And it's <laughs> great. Yes, it worked out wonderfully for me. But I also got a bunch of emails from Takeda and Pfizer and, you know, people that were like, no, thanks. So it is challenging no matter what you do. The communication aspects of your non-academic positions are huge. And you're clearly interacting with many different types of audiences constantly, both science expert and non-expert. Can you talk a little bit about how you approach those kinds of communications needs or how you trained those kinds of skills? Uh, so I kind of took a very non-traditional path in gaining communication experience um, because not, you know, again, I had to kind of cobble together my own ex-academia experience, right? There, we, we didn't have things like, you know, the my hub or anything like that, or you know, I didn't do any internships. So when I, when I was a grad student, um, I actually had to move to Atlanta, Georgia, because my PI um, moved to Georgia State University. And I moved with him, kept my U of R affiliation, obviously. And I, you have, um, Atlanta had a lot of, it, it's a big city, right? So we had a lot of things going on. Um, I ended up volunteering at the Georgia Aquarium as a guide. So could really lean into the scientific communication side of that, not talking about my PhD, but more about, you know, marine biology, things like that. <laughs> we, Atlanta um, has a event every year during the Labor Day uh, weekend called Dragon Con, which is the largest uh, fan run sci-fi convention in the world. And I met some people um, and they ended up running what was the science track. Um, I started volunteering for them and I became an assistant director on that. So I was able to uh, moderate panels, join panels, work with all the scientific communicators there. So it just made for a really colorful resume. And I feel like sometimes <laughs> that's why uh, maybe I got, you know, the first job. It just, you know, it wasn't a typical process. Um, so, and I did, Atlanta also had like the Atlanta Science Festival where you could volunteer to go to schools and teach kids about, you know, any science that you were kind of interested in. So I it was an amalgamation. Um, I don't know if it would fly today, to be honest with you. Uh, but you kind of just have to do whatever you can to bolster your resume and get an experience that you can talk about, even if it's quirky. My last thing, Yin Yin, is just I always like to ask, you know, if there's if you could go back and, and do anything different uh, during your grad school experience. Is, is there anything you can sort of pinpoint? So I think, you know, that's a that's a really interesting question <laughs> because there's always like this, oh, I could have I could have spent more time in the lab. I could have read more papers. I could have done X, Y, and Z. Um, it's not like when I was in grad school, I didn't know I had to read more papers and focus more on my lab work or, you know, do X, Y, and Z. I, so I don't think, you know, maybe thinking about it in those terms is helpful. What I would say is that part of, you know, a lot of during grad school, I did feel kind of, even though I knew I wasn't meant to be in academia, um, I did feel a little out of place because it seemed like all of my cohort knew what they wanted to do um, and they were excelling at it. I may, I was not interested in going down that path, but that also meant that like while they were publishing papers, you know, I wasn't. And I felt kind of behind the eight ball. Um, I do wish that I knew that there is a place, there was a place for me and my phenotype outside of academia, and I didn't have to worry so much. Um, the other thing was I spent a lot of time worrying about what my first job was, because there's this sense of permanence in academia mm -hmm. where, you know, you kind of, you pick your grad school and you pick your program and then you pick your lab. And that's kind of the area that you're going to research in perpetuity and then you pick your postdoc and that's really kind of the niche area and then you pick up you know you get a tenure track position and then it's all kind of that path is really just based on where you went to grad school and so when i was thinking about finding a job i spent a long time going i have to pick the perfect job because that is going to dictate my career forever 
Yeah. I was talking to a friend of mine um, who had, she'd gotten her master's, she'd gotten into the workforce. I was like, you know, how do I find jobs? What do I do this? What do I do that? And I was like, well, what if I get this job and I don't like it? Like genuinely having an existential crisis. And she looked at me like I had, you know, she was just like, get a new job. And I just looked at, and it literally like took 30 seconds to let that sink in. She's like, you don't <laughs> like the job, you know, you know, learn something from it. And then you find a new job. And, and that like was a mind blowing experience for me. Um, and so I wish I'd looked at jobs, not so much as like how my life was going to go, but more of like, this is a skill set. This is an experience that I can get. And then if I don't like it, I can take what I've learned, put it somewhere else and try that experience. Right. And I'm not saying you should do that forever in perpetuity, but you know, if I had had that mindset, I probably wouldn't have had a lot of as much anxiety as I did in trying to find the perfect first job. Yeah, it seems like, you know, when you're 10 or, you know, 15 years into your career, it's kind of, you look back and think like, God, it's a little, you know, it seems silly to think about something that way. But when you're going into your first job, I think I I felt the same things. It's, there is a permanence to it. And it's good to think about it as it, it could be just an experience or, you know, that's great if you find the, the job that you stick with for the rest of your life. And that that's awesome if that's what you want, but it can totally be an experience or just kind of a you know, just a small piece of the journey, I guess. Absolutely. I don't think, you know, we are in that culture anymore where you stay mm -hmm. at a company as your first job, you go through, you know, for however many years and then you retire from the company. Um, and even then, I would assume that as you're in that company, you're moving around and doing different jobs. Right. So it's this like first job or any job is the end all be all. It just puts a lot of unnecessary pressure on you on the job that you know just doesn't need to be there i don't think i have anything else but if folks want to connect with you after this union where, where is the best place to do that i mean linkedin obviously no um, <laughs> in a commercial but uh i would say linkedin is definitely preferred i get so many emails and whatnot um linkedin is a good place uh and i will if 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 I don't respond right away, you know, perhaps ping again. Um, but if if you can, let me know how I can help you, and we can have a much better conversation. All right. Well, thank you so much again for your time today. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate all the tips and stories, and um, it's it's been a lot of fun. So so thank you again. Thanks so much, Jeff.